absolute newbie and maybe a welcome newbie. i'm an absolute newbie and in, in this front so it may be a newbie question also the last thing you said was about uh, freedom and that is very important to me i think that cash uh, well it, it's going to finish i agree with you is still more anonymous and still more safe than uh, bitcoin as i understand it how can you make bitcoin really anonymous if it is uh, sp uh, possible at all yes bitcoin is not yet strongly anonymous it is uh, weakly pseudonymous as we would say um, but there's actually a lot of work uh, we recently had a conference in milan called scaling bitcoin and I would say half the conference at least was about addressing privacy, anonymity, and fungibility of the currency, which is extremely promising development. There's a lot of technologies coming down uh, the pipeline in Bitcoin to make Bitcoin more and more anonymous and to strongly protect your privacy. There's also a number of other related cryptocurrencies um, which you can move your money into and out of in order to increase your anonymity and privacy under certain conditions. So I'm a huge believer that we need strong privacy and anonymity uh, in every aspect of our financial life. Thank Hi, you. Andres, Thank you uh, I'd like you to talk a bit about uh, fungibility. I'm more worried about governments uh, not taking the exchanges, but using the information to devalue specific Bitcoins. Yeah, fungibility is a bit of a problem. It's um, it's difficult to maintain fungibility in Bitcoin. But they haven't really thought about this because it's also difficult to create the kinds of blacklists that you're talking about. First of all, because they don't control all of the exit points. So it's very easy to take those and circulate them in the economy. Second, because one of the fundamental metrics when you're creating a blacklist, does everybody understand what we're talking about? No? Okay. Back to basics. I have a Bitcoin in my address. Let's say you know um, that I received it from another address. You can see that on the ledger. Well, what if you know that that address was a drug dealer? And you say, well, you got paid by someone who got the money through illegal means. Therefore, that money isn't good. You can't spend it. Right? And you make a blacklist that says, any money leaving this address cannot be sold at an exchange. Yes? And you create that blacklist for all of these addresses. What happens then? You destroy the fungibility of the currency. By the way, do you know how that works with dollars? If you receive a dollar and it was stolen in a bank robbery, can you be held responsible? No. Settled law, common law, 16th century England. The courts realized that if they did that, it would destroy the fungibility of the crown's currency. Currency is the only type of property where you cannot be prosecuted for receiving stolen property, because currency is not intended to be individual. It is supposed to be fungible. The fact that there is a serial number on it cannot be used to create a blacklist and say, you must now check every dollar bill and see if it is on the list of bad dollar bills. And the reason for that is because if you do that, it destroys the economy. Now you have to maintain these lists. Everybody has to check these lists. If their list is out of date and they take stolen money, it's not really worth anything. And then what happens to the money that's on the list? Well, its value doesn't go to zero. It doesn't. We saw that with India. What happens is it gets a discount rate. It goes to 80% of the value. And the other 20% funds the people who are going to money launder it for you. That's exactly what happened in India. Gresham's law. Bad money chases out good. Then you receive the 80% discounted money, and because you have it in your pocket, but you also have some good money and you have some bad money, which one are you going to spend first? Good money goes under the mattress, just in case. But bad money, you want to pass hot potato to the next person you meet. Right? I'm going to be a generous tipper with the extra 20% premium. So bad money starts circulating. Two weeks after the demonetization in, in India, the new notes disappeared. <laughs> and all you could find was bad notes, because everybody was trying to get rid of them. So they paid for everything in bad notes. We saw, for the first time in modern history, the demonstration of Gresham's Law in practice in a nation. Um, look it up on Wikipedia. It is fascinating stuff. So in Bitcoin, what happens if you blacklist? Same thing. 
Not all Bitcoin has a value of 100%. Some of it has less value. That money then becomes the preferred currency to exchange with anyone who can get away with using it, cashing it out, selling it to unsuspecting new people on local Bitcoins. They'll probably get fake dollars, but that's a whole other story. Um, <laughs> and so you have this circle which actually creates incentives and disincentives. Except Bitcoin's different. Now what happens if you want to create a blacklist is you have to set a, a, a decision point. You have to say, okay, how far back do I look? So if I have a transaction, if I'm an exchange and I receive a transaction, how far back do I look to see if this has been touched by a bad address? All the way to the Coinbase? All the way to the Genesis block? Right? Not really possible to do that. Okay? Let's say you go six hops. So I'm the bad guy, and I just got this money. And it's one hop. And I can spend it if it's seven hops, but not one hop. So I create six addresses, and I move it from address one to address two to address three to address four to address five to address six. Oh, I cleaned it. Didn't even leave my possession. I just added six hops. Now it's seven hops removed from the blacklisted address. I've created six new addresses that are not blacklisted, and I take it to the exchange and I cash it in. Oh no, that's terrible. So all of the exchanges are hereby on notice. They now have to do seven hops. Okay? So now I built seven addresses. I do eight hops. Oh, it only took me a microsecond of extra computing capacity, but just the cost of sending the notice out to all of the exchanges and having them tweak all their software. And now, by the way, the amount of data they have to sift through for eight hops is an order of magnitude greater than the amount of data they had to sift through six hops. Everybody know the idea of six degrees with Kevin Bacon? <laughs> right? Take any human being on the planet, count six degrees of relationship, and eventually you can arrive at Kevin Bacon. <laughs> there was a website that used to track that. You could give it a name, and it would give you six degrees of how they're connected to Kevin Bacon. Human graphs are massively connected. All right, so they do eight hops, you do ten. They do ten, you do twelve. They, for you, it costs nothing. The bad guy costs nothing. For the exchanges, every time they add a hop, the volume of data they have to process, and then someone launches a currency bomb. So let's say you're a bad guy and you've got a bad Bitcoin. You can't spend it, but you're pretty pissed off about this thing that's happening, right? While it's still seven hops, you clean it up to eight, right? And then you cut it into tenth of a millibit UTXOs. And then you send those to every exchange you know, and every merchant payment service. Now what happens? They are doing a withdrawal at Coinbase or one of the merchant services. They are withdrawing money for the merchant. The merchant, okay, let's package up all of their UTXO, get their balance right. Ah, oh, we need to pay a fee. Hmm. Okay, how much of a fee is it? A tenth of a millibit? Let me see if I have any UTXO lying around that happen to be the perfect size for a fee. Oh, look, there's one. How convenient. It's exactly the right size for a fee. Let me use it to do this withdrawal, and the next withdrawal, and the next withdrawal, and the next withdrawal. I'm paying all of my fees with conveniently sized, eight-hop blacklisted Bitcoin. Then they change the algorithm to ten. You go ten hops back, and every single one of your customers has received the poison pill. And they've given it to someone else, and now the entire Bitcoin economy is tainted. All of it. Everyone. What do you do now? Effectively, you've blacklisted the currency. So either the exchanges go out of business, or they stop with all of this silliness of doing 10 hops, then 12 hops, then 14 hops. You can't do it. It's an unbounded software system. I can do a million hops in three seconds on my laptop and generate a million addresses and cycle all of the funds through. I'll pay a lot in fees. Or we could activate, uh, we could activate Lightning, put it all on the Lightning network. Fungibility goes through the roof. Privacy goes through the roof. Can't track any of that shit. <laughs> Oops. Um, so one of the solutions to fungibility is to move to a second layer. Lightning has incredible fungibility properties. All of the transactions are exchanged between private parties. No one can see where the payment is coming from or where it's going to, where they are in the route, or how many 
other nodes are in the route. If they're the first node, or the second node, or the twentieth node, they can't tell. And if they participate, they route to anyone, by definition. Right? So then, fungibility instantly is no longer a problem. From what I've observed, uh, I think that privacy and anonymity always comes with some cost. Like uh, in Monero, you have, have uh, bigger transactions. With confidential transactions, you need like uh, I think 54 uh, link signatures to, instead of one, and, and so so. Don't, don't you think that uh, such cost could uh, prevent the mass adoption of? Privacy by default? Absolutely. Uh, privacy is inefficient. Privacy is costly. Privacy takes commitment and sacrifice and efforts to implement. And certainly a lot of the people in this room uh, are people who believe that that trade-off is one worth paying, because it pays back in the currency of freedom. And you never really uh, appreciate freedom until you don't have it. Uh, we are extremely privileged, but there are many, many places in the world where the trade-off of cost efficiency and bandwidth efficiency and time efficiency and complexity compared to the value of freedom is a very, very, very easy trade-off. And I, I think that being able to serve that particular community is really important. Uh, privacy is not easy. I mean how, how many how many people in, in in this room are able to make the trade-offs necessary? Even very very committed people. I, I don't think you'll find that many. Um, and so, unfortunately for most people, uh, privacy is not an issue, uh, and freedom is not an issue until you start feeling its loss. Uh, and by that time, it's usually uh, too late.